Anybody else ready for a great weekend? You ready? Um, it's been such a great series. Before we dive into this weekend's message, I want to tell you something really exciting that we've been working on for almost the past year. Uh, we are ready to go live with it on every campus, every single service. We now have a Spanish translation of the message live in the service, and it's available right now. You might say, how, how can you translate uh, the service on every single campus, every single service, it's technology, right? So our team's been working in our app today. If you get on our Wi-Fi, CCV Wi-Fi on any campus, if you've downloaded our app, you can actually open up the app, click on the watch button at the bottom. At, when you do that, at the upper right-hand corner, you'll see an ES Espanol. You touch it, it immediately, right now, what I'm speaking will be translated into Spanish every service every campus, why are we doing that? Because our vision is to reach the entire valley for Christ, amen? That's what we wanna do. And we know there's many people that, that need that translation. So if you know someone who needs a translation, please invite them, please invite them. We also have translated all of our small group content. We have eight Spanish small groups meeting right now. We've translated all of our website. We now have a dedicated YouTube channel that's in Spanish and all of our CCV music, right? We've translated it into Spanish as well. So we're doing this to go reach the valley. So you can cheer for that. It's really exciting what God's doing. Yep. Well, this weekend, we're gonna wrap up our series, What Happens After You Die. It's been a great series. And we told you this weekend, we're gonna answer your questions. So I've invited our teaching pastor, Mark Moore, to join me. Will you help him as he, jo uh, welcome him as he joins the stage? Come on. Oh. You gotta know something. Um, we have been almost like giddy to do this uh, together because as long as we've been teaching together, we've never taught together on the same stage, First time. which is crazy. And so you need to know something. Off the stage, um, we love each other. Like, we really, really do. We have a ton of fun together and we just consider each other friends. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, we were in Israel at the same time with a group from CCV, which you've, if you've never been, put that on your bucket list. But while we were in Israel, we were standing in one of the synagogues in Jesus' hometown where we know Jesus taught in this synagogue. And we were standing in the exact spot where Jesus would have preached in this synagogue, and we just happened to be there together. And someone captured it uh, in, the, in these photos. And we just kind of had this moment in Israel where we looked at each other and we just said, it's unbelievable. Can you believe that we get to do this together, preaching God's word at what we consider the best church in the world? And so, man, I, I love you and it's just an honor to do this with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if, if you guys look at that picture on the left, I mean, that's what you expect to see from a couple guys on stage. But what, what we get to see backstage is the picture on the right. This is who we really are. And you just need to know we, we do honor and love each other. And so to do this, this is a long time coming. It is, I it is. So it. we're going to have some fun. So you submitted a ton of questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. But let me set some ground rules first, okay? Ground rule number one is, um, if you've been at CCV, you know this. This is our truth, okay? The, God's word is our truth. Where, the, where scripture is clear, we'll tell you it's clear, okay? Where scripture is not clear or maybe even silent, we'll tell you that, but we're gonna give you our opinion based on biblical principles, and we'll give you all the scripture references so you can look them up yourselves, and I'd really encourage you to do that because we want you in God's word. And what happens when we share an opinion is you might disagree. That's okay. We hold here at CCV to a statement in the essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in all things love. Yeah. What that means is there's some essentials where God's word's crystal clear and these essentials would be core beliefs that matter and whether you go to heaven or not. In those, we're gonna be unified as a church. But there's a bunch of non-essentials in scripture where scripture's not clear and we can disagree. In other words, we can disagree and still go to heaven. And we're not gonna divide over, there, over those. Is that, is that fair? But in all things, we're gonna love each other because that's our foundation is love. So with that as our foundation, is that fair? We're gonna dive right in today. The first question, this is a big question for many of you. You had a question that basically was like, hey, when we die and we get a new body in heaven one day, and that is true, we do get a new body, 
Your question was, when does that happen? Do I get a new body? And what is my new body going to look like? So one you, of those... You saw is, the picture yeah, a minute ago, Yeah, you ago, saw right? the picture. I mean, one of those is really clear. When do I get a new body? The other one, what's it going to look like, is not clear. Okay, let's, let's walk through each of them. When do I get a new body? This is clear. We talked about week one. When you die, your body and your soul immediately separate. I want to remind you what I said in, in week one. I said this to you, and I think it's really clear. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And that's, that's good to let that sink in because this body we have on earth, this is very temporary. Our soul is what's going to live forever somewhere. So when you die, your body's buried. Your soul immediately goes into the presence of Jesus. Now, when do we get a new body? At Jesus' second coming. We know in, in Scripture, Jesus is going to come again, and when Jesus comes again, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and that's when we get a new body. Our old body is raised from the dead, and we get a new body in heaven. Actually, the Apostle Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, this is a different body, made for us by who? By God himself and not by human hands. So that's when we get our new body, is when Jesus comes again. Now what's it going to look like? A lot of debate. This has actually been debated since the time of Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. They had the same question. Listen to this. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body will they come? They had the same question we do. Like, what's our new body going to be like in heaven? I've heard some people say, your new body is going to be what you look like when you were age 33. <laughs> because that's when Jesus died and rose from the grave. I'm like, well, that's pretty speculative, probably a little hogwash, right? I've heard some people say your new body will be the day on earth you look your very best. <laughs> and you're kind of like, well, what day was that, you know? And I was, you know, Mark and I were talking like, what day did, was the best day you ever had on earth? You know, best day ever. We're like, we don't know. We should probably ask our wives, you know, like what was the best day? So I asked Jamie, he asked Barbara, and when I asked Jamie to send pictures of what she thought was the best day I ever looked on earth, these are the pictures she sent, these two pictures right here, okay? <laughs> that's, me, that's me as a kid. She's like, that's as good as it gets. I was like, thanks. One, I had glasses. The other, I had a haircut from my mom. My mom used to cut my hair when I was little. She did a great job, right? So, uh, You want to see mine? Yeah, you want to see, see mine? mine? This is not much better. Here it is. So I everyone know. goes, ah, oh, to know. yours, you know? Well, because this answers a question that people ask me a lot. Did you ever look adorable? <laughs> that's one of yes, my, I did. That's my favorite picture of you, by the way. I love the glasses. First two. Uh, yeah, I bet you it is. So what is our body going to look like? It's unclear, but we have some clues, okay? And the clue we have, I think, biblically, is that our new body will be similar but different. Let me tell you why we believe that scripturally, okay? The Apostle Paul is writing about this new body we're gonna get, okay? And he gives us a clue that it will be similar but different. He talks about a seed. He says, your old body, this body, this earthly body, when it dies, is kind of like a seed. When you plant a seed, the seed dies, and then when the seed dies, it sprouts up a plant. The plant is similar but different than the seed. Fair enough? And Paul gives us this analogy. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put into the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Now, I think it's very interesting he gives us the only analogy of, of, of a seed, he says, is maybe like a wheat seed. That's very telling because can I show you what a wheat seed looks like? This is what a wheat seed looks like. And when you plant it and it dies, it grows a wheat plant, which looks like this. It is similar but different. 
And this may be a clue of what our new body in heaven is going to look like. We have no idea, but it's going to be similar but different. Paul goes on to say this. He gives us four analogies of some of the differences. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes on, he says, in the same way with the resurrection of the dead, our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they'll be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they'll be raised as spiritual bodies. Four analogies. Can I give them to you really quick? Our earthly versus our spiritual body, our heavenly body. One is perishable, one is imperishable. Our new body will never die, ever. It is imperishable. The second thing he says is one is broken, and that that word means to, to be seeped in shame, and the other is in glory. It's perfect. I want to pause here. Some of us have big body issues, okay? We have some things about our body we're really ashamed of. Is that fair? It just causes shame. When you get to heaven, you will have no shame about your body. It will be perfect. Amen? That sounds good, right? Uh, The third thing he tells, one's weak, one will be completely strong. No sickness, no issues, no mental health problems, nothing. And the last thing he says is one is obviously natural, the other is spiritual. It's in heaven. In other words, when you get to heaven and get a new body, it is perfect. Imagine a perfect body, no flaws, no sickness, no weakness, no anxiety, no depression, nothing. That should get us crazy excited, right? That's what God has in store for us in heaven, which leads to maybe the number one, this is actually not maybe, this is the number one question you asked. If if we get a new body, if some of you are thinking, if we get a new body, what about cremation? Like if I'm cremated, do I forfeit getting a new body? Do I forfeit heaven in general? Talk to us about cremation. It's, a, it's been a sensitive topic. Yeah, because a lot of people are uncomfortable with cremation because how can God raise a body that is burned? Well, what we know scientifically is when you burn something, it goes into the atoms. The same thing happens when you decay in the ground. And so it's no more difficult for God to raise a body that was burned than one that decayed into the ground. And in fact, I wasn't aware of this until just recently, there's actually a cremation, multiple, in the Bible. The first one was the very first king of Israel. It says, when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard that what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Beth Shan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh where they burned them. It it wasn't condemned. It wasn't a non-Jewish thing to do or an ungodly thing to do. They burned their bodies, and God is certainly able to raise bodies that have been burned. And if you think about it, you know this is true. How many martyrs were burned at the stake? Don't you think God will raise them? How many firefighters died in the line of duty? Don't you think God will raise them? How many people in in different ways have been like the Holocaust? And God can raise them. Now, if you have a different opinion, that's fine. My wife and I actually have a different preference of what happens to our bodies after we die. I want to be cremated. She wants to be buried. So we agreed. Whoever goes first gets to decide. If she goes first, (laughs) cremation. If I go first, she's going to bury me. I hope that goes well for you. (laughs) <laughs> how would I why would I care you're dead that's true very true so both of us agree uh, cremation is okay I mean it, it puts God pretty small to think that God can't raise from the dead something that was burned right I mean yeah. we, we have a big God but the big question that a lot of people of you ask is okay when we get to heaven and we get these new bodies will we recognize each other and will there be marriage these are big questions, right? So I want to answer both these. One of them is very clear scripturally. Um, the other's not. Uh, what, what's not clear is will we recognize each other? Um, both of us would agree that we believe scripturally, based on some principles I'll show you, that we think we will recognize each other. Mm-hmm. And, and I hope we do. I'll tell you why we believe that. When Jesus' resurrected body, when Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples recognized him, didn't they? When in in Luke chapter 16, when it says there was a rich man and Lazarus, that parable, the rich man recognized Lazarus in heaven. 
And in Revelation, we know that John recognized the 24 elders. So we, we would think there's some principles that would lean in that direction. This is debatable, so we don't need to divide over it. But I really personally hope we do recognize each other, don't you? Um, I, wanna, I wanna see my kids, I hope they recognize me. Um, I wanna recognize family, I hope Jamie recognizes me. I hope I recognize her. Um, the question is, what about marriage? Will there be marriage in heaven? This one is crystal clear, and Jesus was the one that was clear on it. Jesus, talking about the afterlife, he actually said this in Matthew 22, said, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So there is not marriage in heaven, okay? Now, what I'm banking on, though, is when Jamie sees my new resurrected body, <laughs> my chiseled, ripped, resurrected body God gives me, she is gonna recognize me and she's gonna wanna at least live in, live in the same house, for sure. <laughs> Maybe next door, I don't know, right? What about intimacy, though, Mark? Let's talk about, like, people have questions about intimacy in heaven, too. Yeah, I mean, that's another, that's another one of those questions that the Bible doesn't give us any definitive answer on. Here, here's what I would say, that God gave us these physical bodies on this earth, and, and we have all kinds of, physical intimacy is just one of the ways that we enjoy pleasure through touch and sensations. Don't you think that when God creates our new bodies, in a new heaven, a new earth, that our physical sensations will be both deeper and wider. Now, I don't know what all that means, but I know this. And again, the Bible doesn't say it, but this one, in my opinion, I'm really confident on this. There will be no one in heaven thinking about the physical sensations they got on earth and say, boy, I really miss that. <laughs> hey, we have a good God. We have a good God. Yes, we do. We have a good God, all right? It will be better in heaven whatever is happening in heaven, right? Now, Mark, that's... Good God, chiseled bod. That's right, yeah, that's a, that's a good, <laughs> good line. Now, a, a lot of people had this question as well. When we think about going to heaven, we've talked about this in the series, in the afterlife, we've said that there are rewards in heaven based on what happens on earth, and that's confusing for some people. Is that, is that fair? And so, weigh into that a little bit more. Yeah, questions. and this is a question we actually do have some biblical answers for. Now, we know that we're saved by grace through faith. In other words, you're not getting to heaven by your good works. And because of that, some people say, well, if I'm not getting to heaven by good works, then there are no levels of reward in heaven based on good works, but that doesn't follow. You're not saved by your works, you're saved by grace, but that doesn't mean you won't be rewarded for your works once you get there. In fact, this is from Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 16. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And not once, but twice. Go to the book of Revelation, and we read Revelation 22, 12. Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So we will have different levels of reward in heaven. And I know that bothers some people because, and I get it, doesn't that seem selfish? That I just want to have a big old crown so I can strut down streets of gold. It is not selfish. I want to tell you why. Ashley, I, I plan, I'm trying to get a bigger crown than you. Um, I'd say bring it, bring it. And it's not competition between us. We both want all of us, every person on every campus and you watching online, we want you to have that aggressive desire for a great reward in heaven, and here's why. I wanna read another passage out of Revelation where they actually got crowns. I mean, crowns, jewels. And what did they do with those? Revelation chapter four, starting in verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. I want a crown that's huge. Not so that people can look at me in envy, 
Not so that I can strut down streets of gold, but for one moment in time. I would give all of my life for one moment in time for the one who died for me, the one I teach about and talk about, and the one I follow, so that in that moment, when I take my crown, however big it is, and I lay it down at his feet, that for one moment in time, all of heaven would rise to their feet and say, that is a life worthy of a king. Mm. All my days for that one moment. Yeah. That is why I want a reward in heaven. Not for me, but for his glory. That puts a, a little bit different light on it. Yeah, what it? I, and let me just say one thing on that, Mark. What I like about that too is when we get rewards here on earth, what, who are they for? We're to use them for God's glory even here on earth. And the same thing when we get to heaven, it's the same principle when we are rewarded in heaven. It's not for us, it's for God's glory. And I think that's, that, that is a very good principle for you to practice now because that's what's gonna happen later. Yeah, yeah and I, lo I love how you say that because we are actually in many ways practicing now what we will live for eternity in heaven, right. which is opposite of the world. Okay, here's another question. Will we have memories or regrets in heaven, and will there be sin in heaven? Well, this is, this is not one that the Bible talks about. So you mind if I speculate for a minute? This is just my opinion. Will there be memories? Yes. And the reason I say that is the parable that uh, Ashley referred to a minute ago, Dives and Lazarus, Luke 16, they remembered what happened on earth. And, and the martyrs of Revelation 7, they remembered what happened on earth and actually saw what was going on on earth. So I do think there's a little kind of clue there will be memories. Regrets, how could it be heaven if you have regrets? Hmm. Now what you might be thinking is, okay, if I have memories of what I did on earth, how could I not have regrets of what I did on earth? Here's the way I've thought about it. How many of you have ever said, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but I wouldn't have God take it away from me for anything in the world? Hmm. Some of our deepest pain becomes our highest platform on earth to preach Jesus. It's what you've, the mistakes that you've made that you've learned from and grown from that's your greatest growth. So what if in heaven the gain that you get from your pain is not just learning to live a better life, but what if that very pain, that very sin, that very regret that was a regret on earth is a cause for praising Jesus in heaven? So you know your sin now. You know what you've done. But I would venture to say, you don't have a clue of how great your sin actually is. Because you can't see it in the light of God. You compare your sin to your next door neighbor, and according to him, I mean, he's kind of a jerk, and you're better than him. But you compare your sin to Jesus face to face, and you will be in awe, thunderstruck with the greatness of God, with the, with the breadth of his grace and the depth of his love. I think the very things that cause us pain and regret here will actually be a cause for praise and glory in heaven. So good. So, I mean, that brings us to another question about sin in heaven because sin is what causes our regrets. Will we still sin in heaven? Because we'll still have free will in heaven, right? Some people think, well, yeah, I mean, if I still have free will, I could still make bad choices. Well, let me ask you a question. And again, I'm speculating. What causes you to sin right now on earth? I can point to four things at least that cause me to sin. One is the devil and his demons. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even need to say the devil made me do it because I'm perfectly capable of sinning without his help. <laughs> but he does help a lot, right? He won't be there. So just take the devil and the demons out and my sin will be cut in half at least. Second thing that causes me to sin is a corrupt society. And I'm driving around, minding my own business, and somebody, you know, they think I did something wrong on the, on the I-10 or something, and they're, you know, waving it with just one finger. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, God bless their soul. Uh -huh. The world we live in, the lust, the greed, mm. it pushes us towards sin. None of that will be in heaven. You take out the devil and society from heaven, and I'll be a lot closer than I am right now to being sinless. 
Third thing that caused me to sin is this body. There's just some desires and drives for gluttony and lust and greed. But the new body that I have, think about this. My spirit inside me is already redeemed. And there's a battle going on within me because my flesh wants one thing, my spirit wants another. But in heaven, your new body will have desires that align with your redeemed spirit. I will be really close to being sinless except for one thing. One thing trips me up, and it's not the biggest thing, but it is one thing. I prioritize projects over people. I'm just really driven. And sometimes I can ignore people or bypass people or be short with people because I've got something to do and a little bit of time to do it. And because I'm rushed to get things done, I'm packing my day, I'm filling my to-do list. Because I'm rushed, I will often make mistakes simply because I don't have enough time. You know what you have in heaven? All the time you need. You take those four things away, and I am convinced, though I can't prove it scripturally, I'm convinced we will actually be sinless in heaven. Mm, I like that. So we won't sin in heaven, probably have some memories, but no regret. No regrets. Uh, I really like that. And, you know, speaking of regret, maybe one of the top questions you asked was, will there be pets in heaven? <laughs> you asked this, I'm gonna answer it, okay? And I'm, I might surprise you with my answer. By I, I, I bet you can't yeah. guess what he's about to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Will there be pets in heaven? It depends on, are we talking about dogs? Or what are we talking about, you know? I can, uh, we, we got a dog last year. I don't know if you know that. Uh, we got a Bernadoodle. We love, we actually love our dog. Uh, we, uh, her name's Honey. Uh, this is a picture of Honey she, at, as a puppy and then now as an adult. Uh, Jamie having some fun with her. She looks human enough, right? I mean, am I gonna see Honey in heaven? I wonder why there's so many misspellings in your emails. Yeah. <laughs> Will you see your pet in heaven? The Bible is very clear on one thing, there will be animals in heaven. Did you know that? Will you see your pet? That's unclear. Now let's, let's, let me just break this down. The Bible's clear there will, be, there will be animals in heaven. Did you know that? It, actually, in Genesis chapter one and two, when God created Eden, the paradise, Adam and Eve were with what? A ton of animals. And then they sinned and they were kicked out of paradise. In Revelation, the last two chapters of Revelation, last two chapters of the entire Bible, it says God comes back and he creates a new Eden. The new earth is like a new Eden and there are animals there. Did you know that? Can I show it to you clearly? Isaiah writes about the new heaven and the new earth. Watch this, he says in Isaiah 65, see, I'll create a new heaven and a new earth. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw with the ox. There are animals there. And watch this, Isaiah eleven six says, the wolf will live with the lamb, what? The leopard will lie down with the goat. I thought leopards ate goats. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. What are we being told? In a perfect place, all the animals will actually all get along. This is amazing to me. Dogs and cats will like each other in heaven, okay? So what, I, what I'm yeah. hearing you say is there's hope for cats to be saved. I'm not, like saying, I'm not saying that, but I think there, there, there could be okay. animals in heaven, okay? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. There's going to be it, animals in heaven, right? Is this essentials, opinions? Or... It's, a, it's definitely opinions, okay. okay? It's definitely opinions. But amazingly, there's animals in heaven, okay? Now, will your pet be there? We don't know. But I would just say this. I think you can't write off out of God's lavish love for you that it is a definite possibility with animals being there, would one of those animals be yours? Maybe, maybe, is that fair? And I think that's really the biblical answer. I don't wanna get, answer this flippantly, I just wanna answer it biblically. There are animals in heaven, maybe yours will be there too. Now, Mark, pets in heaven is a very personal question that's kind of weighty for some people. Um, a, a, a question a lot more people had, though, was really about this idea of, okay, when I die, my soul separates from my body. Is there a waiting period? Do I still have to kind of go to sleep for a while, my soul? Is there a purgatory? Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, so this idea of soul sleep, that after you die, you're asleep until Jesus comes back, it was really a, a misunderstanding of when the New Testament said, you will fall asleep. Well, that's a euphemism for death. 
Now, what we know from people in the Bible who died is they were quite aware of what was going on. I just mentioned the, the martyrs of Revelation 7 or dives and Lazarus of Luke 16. You're not going to be asleep. You're not going to be unconscious. You will be very much conscious of the life going on around you. But, but the, one other question that people ask is, what about like this idea of being purged for my sins? Because I don't know if you've ever felt like this. I have where I know that I'm saved by Jesus, but gosh, I, 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 need to be, I need to be purged to get into heaven. And that idea about the 12th century was turned into purgatory, which is an idea of you're, if you die and you're not really ready for God, I mean, you, you believe in him and, and, and you're saved by Jesus' blood, but you need to be cleansed in some way. It talks about a place of kind of atoning for your sins before you're let into heaven. Again, that's not in the Bible. That was 12th century. I can tell you this with confidence. You don't need purgatory if you have Jesus hmm. because his blood covers all of your sins. Of course you're not ready to get to heaven. That's the reason Jesus had to die for your sin. And when you think that you have to add some time of suffering or beat yourself up in some way, and some of you are doing that right now, you're making your own purgatory right now, you don't have to do that anymore. Because all of your past and all of your shame is covered by the blood of Jesus. And your entry into heaven isn't a ticket that you purchase or buy or earn or suffer for. It's the blood of Jesus on you. And you go to heaven with the blood of Jesus on you, your entrance is immediate and your entrance is full. I think the, the question that people are really asking about this is not really about themselves. You know, what happens after I die? I think most people are asking that because they've had someone they loved who died. And if that's you, we, we genuinely are sorry for your loss. And I know people have stories of how there was a loved one who died and I felt their presence or maybe you feel like you got a message from them and, may, and maybe you did. I'm not, I, I'm not commenting on that at all. I'm not critical of that at all. Here's where it gets dangerous. You miss someone so deeply that you want to talk to them again. And so you, you try to find a way of communicating with the dead. That is crossing a line that God told you not to cross. And I'm gonna read the scripture very clearly out of Leviticus. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. There's two parts of that sentence. Don't go to mediums. In other words, don't use Ouija boards. Don't try to talk to the dead. Don't go to a seance. Don't go to some witch or warlock. If you do, it's just like Satan to use that to imitate your loved one to draw you in. You could endanger yourself by entering into a dark spiritual world that you know not of. The second part of that sentence says, I am the Lord your God. And I'm telling you, if you have lost someone you love, God will be with you. And his presence will be the comfort and strength that you need. So if you have felt the presence of a departed loved one, just receive it as a gift, but don't seek to speak to or experience the presence of a loved one because that can be, that can be really dangerous. I think that's key for someone here today, maybe that needs to hear that. Now another heavy question that some people have been asking is, and I think this stirred up from this series, is can I lose my salvation? Yeah, and <clears throat> let me just put it this way. It's your salvation is not a set of car keys. It's not like, oop, where did it go? Because I, I think we've all heard this preaching like, you know, hellfire and brimstone, and you feel like, oh, now I've had a bad day or I've sinned, so now I'm not saved, and then I repent and I get baptized, and now I am saved, and then I commit another sin again, and now I'm not saved. Look, it's not an in and out. You're not losing salvation and then coming back in. Losing salvation, like that whole talk is putting salvation on you and it's not it is on Jesus and I want you to know whether you're watching online or one of our campuses you are absolutely secure in your salvation in Jesus and, and it wasn't your goodness that got you saved 
So it won't be another sin that breaks the camel's back and gets you unsaved. So can we just dispel that myth? Like you're not going to hell because of one more sin. Now that doesn't mean you should go out and sin willy-nilly because you're saved. But there's another question. Can I walk away from Jesus? I'm not talking about one more sin. Can I deliberately walk away from him? Some theologians call this once saved, always saved, that once you're in, you, there's no out for you. Like you can't get out the door, it's locked. Now I know some smart people on both sides of the aisle will debate and show scriptures. Here's my opinion, my best reading of scripture. There are passages that warn you about walking away from Jesus. The Bible calls this the unpardonable sin or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Let me just make it very clear. It's not some secret sin that you do by accident. Oops, didn't mean to step there. It is a deliberate and willful and final rejection of Jesus. And the Bible warns against it. And so I'm, I just can't deny that it's real. The, the, the technical word is apostasy, stepping away from Jesus. Again, it's not a sin you commit. It's a posture you take where I reject you. Think of it as spiritual divorce, and it is irreversible. And so some of you are going, well, what if, like, what if I've done it? Maybe I've committed this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, this unpardonable sin. Maybe I've rejected Jesus. Hmm. If you're asking the question, you have not. How do I know? Because we come to Jesus, not because we're intelligent or spiritual or good. We come to Jesus because God is drawing us. And if you feel a desire to be drawn to God, that's not you. That's God inviting you to respond to him. So let me just say this, because I know a lot of people feel in a moment drawn to God, and they ignore it. And it can go away. I'm just warning you. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you feel drawn to God, do not delay, do not wait. Today, give your life to him. Amen. Repent of your sins, get baptized, and express your faith publicly because you don't have an assurance that that closeness of connection will endure forever. Don't delay. Come to Jesus today. Now, there is one more question, and this leads into this question because some people wonder if a friend of theirs or a family member has committed an unpardonable sin by taking their own life. Yeah, this, this is a hard one, and I, I wanna lead into this very pastorally. If, I mean, if you know someone that committed suicide, and um, the question becomes, does that become a barrier to them experiencing heaven? Is that the unpardonable sin? And the first thing I wanna tell you is I'm really sorry if, that's, if you've had someone that's, that, that's, that's done that. Um, I've had friends, I've done a funeral for a neighbor. Uh, it's very, very hard and, and I just wanna to say to someone here today, if, if you're even considering it, because someone here today is considering suicide, and I want you to look at me in the eyes and I just wanna tell you it's never the answer, ever. In fact, suicide is very selfish because you wanna remove your pain, but in you doing that, you put the pain on everyone else around you. And it's never the answer. In fact, this Easter, this past Easter, we had a woman that came to our Easter services, and that day on Easter Sunday, she had planned to commit suicide. And God drew her to church for some reason. She came, she gave her life to Jesus. God is transforming her life through Jesus, and she has been saved. That's the answer, is Jesus, amen? So if you're, if you're thinking about suicide, please hear me. It's never the answer, yeah. right? Now, and, and there's always hope, there's always help, we're here. That's right, we're here to help you. Um, but for those that ha have, have, have died by suicide, I wanna be very, very clear on this, it is not the unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. It does not preclude you from the hope of eternity in heaven at all. We know that even from scripture, there's actually seven examples of suicide in scripture, and never once does it lean into that it is an unpardonable sin that, that you are no longer able to go to heaven because of that. And people might ask about what about Judas, Jesus' disciple that committed suicide. Listen, if Judas is not in heaven, it is not because of suicide, it is because he rejected Jesus fully 
what Mark talked about it a moment yeah. ago. Yeah. So the, please hear that on suicide, and I hope that's comforting for some of you because you've wondered about that, right? Actually, I, I, I want to throw this one last question to you. I, I know we're uh, coming short on the end of our time, but this is probably the most important question that you could ever ask about heaven. Here it is. Can I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? Yeah. What this series has done, because I've heard from so many of you, is it stirred something in you. And you're wondering, if I died, would I have the hope of heaven? Can I be sure? And I want you to hear this. You can be 100% certain about heaven. Come on. How? Not because of your good works, not because you've done enough, not because you showed up to church enough times, and not because you were born in a Christian family. Your hope for eternity is because of one thing, your faith in Jesus, that you are following Jesus. You made a decision to follow Jesus. Right. In other words, if you died today and you were in front of God today and God was like, why should I let you into heaven? I said this week one, this isn't original to me, but if your answer to him is ever because of I, because I did this or I was good and I was a good person, you've immediately disqualified yourself. The only answer is in the third person, because he, because Jesus came, your son died on a cross and shed his blood and I placed my faith in Jesus and because of what he did, that's my answer, that's your end. And if, if you've decided to follow Jesus, you can be 100% certain of the hope of heaven. The problem is some of you have not made that decision. That's why you're wondering and you should wonder. What does it mean to follow Jesus? We talk about around here A, B, and C. You admit you're a sinner, that you can't do it on your own, you don't get into heaven by your good works. B, you believe Jesus is the only answer, and C, you confess Jesus is Lord and you commit your life to him by being baptized, repenting and being baptized. Have you done that? If you have, you have total certainty. If you haven't, today's your day. Talk to one of our pastors, talk to one of our staff, because we don't want you walking away without the hope of eternity that is available to you. But for all of us, as we wrap up this series today, remember, what you believe about heaven and eternity should dictate how you live today. Mm -hmm. And we need, a, we need a world of Christians to wake up that this world is not our home. Eternity is our home, and every day we need to wake up and think about eternity and the people around us that don't have the hope of Jesus and what that means to them and our responsibility to go reach them for Jesus, amen? We need Christians to wake up, yep. wake up. It's heaven and hell we're talking about. And so I wanna challenge you as we end this series to today, put eternity on your heart and start reaching people around you that don't know Jesus. It's our responsibility. And next weekend, you have a perfect, op perfect opportunity to do it. We have Mother's Day coming next weekend. We have Christine Kane coming to CCV to speak. If you've never heard her speak, she's maybe one of the best communicators on the planet. She's unbelievable. And moms, you have a leg up next weekend. Because if you have anyone around you, family member, spouse, kids that don't know Jesus, here's what you tell them. They say, what do you want for Mother's Day, Mom? You say, one thing you to come to church with me. That's what you say. I'm serious, because we only have a short amount of time here on earth, and there's no time to waste. And as we wrap up our series today, I'm just gonna ask Mark to come and pray over all of us that we would get serious about Jesus. And for anyone here that's not accepted Jesus, that you would decide to go all in. Amen? Come on, Mark. Holy Father, Thank you for sending your son, who is the difference between heaven and hell. Help us to proclaim him boldly as a church. Help, him to, help us to seek him relentlessly as a people. And as we do on all our campuses, with the people who know you, spread your fame across this valley so that every man, woman, and child would have the hope of eternity through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We'll see you at Mother's Day. Have a great week, CCV.